did check last time here back with another video here we go, i'm going to play you a video from brad garling house where he appears at um dc fentech week and he he's going to talk about the issues with the sec the overreach um the three uh cases that they lost against um ripple ripple um um embarking in all in other countries in the uk regulations are, are approved and Europe and Dubai and all those kind of things. It's important for you guys to listen to this because Ripple is going to be on a tear soon, um, quite simply because of this. It will be on a tear, then it will pull back, but then it will go on a tear after that because there's going to have a lot of use case going forward because it's one of those um, assets that has more clarity than, say, all the other assets that are out there, especially 23,000 of them. Anyway, let me get you to play. to another very short trip in Washington for you. Uh, very short this time, but it's always good to be back in Washington. You're going to have to spend any time at the SEC while you're here this time? Maybe a photo op? No, I'm kidding. <laughs> <laughs> no, uh, no, no planned visits to the SEC, but I would welcome that. I mean, honestly, I think an open dialogue between industry and the SEC would be a step forward from where we are now. Well, of course, what we're all referring to, and I think everyone in this room pretty much knows what I'm talking about, is the SEC case, which a judge ruled in your favor around XRP and whether or not it was improperly issued as a security. Are we calling that done and dusted, or are you bracing yourself for some kind of remedy or appeal process? Well, look, I think the SEC clearly lost on everything that matters. Uh, there is a remedy process which continues forward. There's the unknown, and I know Chair Gensler is on stage later. You should ask him if they're going to appeal. Uh, that would be great. <laughs> look, I, 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 that's not a knowable thing. Uh, I, I, it, from my point of view, they lost on the things they care most about. But by the same token, if they move the it up the appellate ladder, it becomes more amplified as a decision of consequence. And so it'll be interesting. It's a, I think there's a strategic trade-off. I'm sure there's way more lawyers in this room than uh, I'm comfortable, you know, that you guys know more about it than I do. But uh, I, I think it's to be determined whether or not I choose to appeal. I think regardless of whether they appeal, I feel really good about it. I think it's very clear the SEC now has lost, they lost three times with Ripple. They lost, uh, I know the CEO Grayscale is on, you know, they lost the Grayscale case. And by the way, these are federal judges saying things, I'll, I'll quote Grayscale, the judge said that the SEC was being arbitrary and capricious. Mm. I mean, this is damning language from a federal judge. Like, you know, I also happen to believe as long as I'm on a roll here, like <laughs> at some point when you have the same, you keep trying to do the same thing and you keep having the same outcome, at some point you change your approach. What well, I hope it would be magical if Chair Gensler got up here and said, hey, we're going to change our approach. We have lost time and time and time again, so let's, re let's step back. Apparently, we haven't had it right because the judicial branch is saying we keep getting it wrong. Mm. And so it, like, it would be great to have that constructive dialogue. I would be happy to go to the SEC today. Okay. Actually, today would be tough. But uh, Yeah, I know you have, he has to get on a flight to Dubai in a couple of hours, so we'll pass the message along to Chair Gensler <laughs> when he arrives. But I would come back from Dubai here to meet with Chair Gensler. Okay. On the record, he says yeah. this. So you mentioned that there was a win in the Ripple case and in the Grayscale case, or a loss on the other hand for the SEC. But of course, those aren't the only high profile cases the SEC is currently pursuing. They've brought cases against Binance, against Coinbase. Does the Ripple case teach us anything about what might happen in those cases? How do you view the debate around XRP in the context of those cases? Look, I followed the Coinbase case a little more closely, uh, and so maybe I, like, I can comment there a little bit more. I, look, I, I think that the, the challenge has been, and again, even if you read what the, or listen to what the judge has said in some of the early Coinbase uh, procedural stuff, you know, I, the SEC is not trending well there. And again, if at some point you would think if you keep getting losses, you would say, okay, wait a minute, let's step back, let's reevaluate, or even better, let's be part of championing a legislative solution. Let's not go to Congress and testify and say, the laws are clear. The laws clearly uh, could be much clearer at a minimum. And you know, I, I think what we're seeing in the Coinbase case, it, the world is not just a simple Howey test. And we have seen some momentum around legislative solutions. Obviously, uh, Washington, it's hard to get things passed in Washington. Uh, in some ways, that's a good thing. In some ways, that's bad. But 
Uh, I'm hopeful that in 2024, we do see some legislative momentum that actually does provide that clarity. And it would be a magical thing if the SEC were part of that, working constructively with the industry to find that right path. Well, you say you're hopeful that something happens legislatively, but ultimately the way things are going right now, do you think more clarity is likely to come from Congress or is it just going to continue to come from the courts and the judicial branch? I think that's a question for Chair Gensler. I mean, he, right now he has taken our approach of your regulation through enforcement. That is not a, in my judgment, constructive way to regulate. Look, I, like one of the things that is most frustrating about this, I mean, Ripple spent well over $150 million defending that case. There is no recourse. So, you know, the, 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 the case was brought by Bill Henman and Jay Clayton. Bill Henman and Jay Clayton, let, I mean, Jay Clayton left office the next day. Right. It, you know, it just feels a little bit like this wasn't, uh, this was not an, uh, <laughs> There's just no recourse to the SEC. There's no negative outcome for anyone. And I think it's really, really confusing to me when you know Bill Hinman got up to the world in 2018 and said, ETH is not a security. And you know now we know from the litigation with Ripple that the, the SEC's general counsel even said, this is going to make things less clear. Mm. This isn't following the Howey test. So, you know, it just, it feels a little bit, and I think there should be, you know, some call to accountability uh, and even an investigative work. Like, how did, like, why, why would we take an approach of putting Ripple on the defense if we got to spend $150 million to show that it, the law actually doesn't say what they're saying? And then in another case say, okay, we think this one's clear. Like the, the government should not be picking winners and losers. So as we talk about this litigation, do you think, if there is an appeal in your case or in, in one of the other cases we've talked about that ultimately this ends up with the Supreme Court, that this goes all the way to the top? I think that definitely could happen. I mean, certainly, I and mean, we've said this publicly, we are in it till the end. So you'd take it to SCOTUS? A hundred percent. By the way, I, I just, again, there's a lot of lawyers in this room. That is a good thing. I mean, the current Supreme Court, I'd, uh, I would, I, I, we'd love to see the Vegas odds on how that would go. They haven't been super friendly to regulators, they I think is what you're alluding to. regulators, no. And so, it, look, and that goes back to my earlier point. I don't know if the SEC will choose to appeal this decision. Mm -hmm. If they do, I think it, it risks to them amplifying, you know, something that they're not yet saying. Uh, I, I think it'd be more constructive for the SEC and even the industry just to say, look, okay, let's step back, let's reevaluate. As you know, I'm going from here to Dubai. Other regulators around the world, like we we have been in this dialogue. I've been talking to other regulators around the world for years, and there's an open dialogue, there's a constructive dialogue. The US used to be looked at as a leader from securities regulation and protecting consumers. I think it's become a political liability. Hmm. The, the way the SEC has approached this in the United States, we are looked at here in the US relative to other countries as stuck you know just we, we are not leading and even worse it's just kind of looked at the, the other countries are absolutely leading the uk i mean i happen to be going to the uae later today but uh i could name five or six countries japan even australia uh switzerland singapore i mean these are all countries that are leading and by virtue of that you're seeing capital investment you're seeing entrepreneurs set up shop in those countries because the rules are clear. I want to come back to that rest of the world versus the U.S. point, but just to clarify something quickly, because you just said you'll take it to the Supreme Court if you have sure. to. You will ride this out, fight it in the court until it is done if the SEC appeals. There's no chance that you would end up settling in some way. Well, that's a slightly different question. I mean, look, uh, <laughs> but I, I, we've talked a little bit about this publicly now. I, I was offered the ability to settle prior to, to, you know, they didn't just sue Ripple, they sued me. Yes. And they They've sued dropped Ms. Larson. Now, right? That has all been uh, all dropped with prejudice. And so, you know, look, that feels really good. Asterisk, it feels like, how did we end up here? Like what you sued me as if it was clear, I had to knowingly sell, know that XRP is a security and act recklessly to not know, and people here in the law like, know more about this than I do, but like there was no chance they were gonna win that. and. It, they're pushing it the way they did, it just feels like the SEC should be part of the solution. Other countries, it's no problem. And you joke, I mean, I think you were joking to my meeting with the SEC today. <laughs> In another country, that wouldn't, 
I've met with central banks. I've met with, uh, you name the regulator and it's kind of like, yeah, no problem. And a, a open meeting, open dialogue. We talk about Ripple's doing, we talk about our view on the crypto industry. No problem. Here in the US, it's like, uh, you know, it's like, oh, the laws are clear, mm-hmm. but yet we can't answer is ETH a security. Yeah, that's something that the chairman has still not actually uh, I, I don't expressed know if you're an opinion him today, on. But ask him again today. Maybe I'll find him behind the curtain somewhere. <laughs> I'll let you know. Um, okay, so let's go back to the U.S. and the rest of the world topic, as you were just discussing it there. Where do you think the best example is being set? What should the U.S. be trying to replicate, or does the U.S. just need to be doing something different, but taking that regulatory regulatory approach differently? I, like, I, I partly because they're you know a close economic and political partner to the U.S. I, the United Kingdom, the U.K. I think has been very constructive on crypto, and that uh, you know I get, when I say that it, they're not you know again Chair Gensler likes to talk about crypto as the Wild West. It is absolutely not the Wild West. Uh, you know Ripple is a regulated company in many jurisdictions around the world. Uh, again, the Sing- in Singapore, we have our uh, license from MAS as a major payments provider. Uh, in the UK, we have, well, in, U- in Dubai, we've applied for the virtual asset regulatory, I can't borrow, I can't remember what the A stands for. But, you know, it's not the Wild West, and I think it's, it's a narrative. To promote, I guess, a political agenda as opposed to sound policy. And, uh, you know, I think there's still time for the U.S. to remain a key leader in this space. And some of the most important crypto companies in the world are based here in the United States. But, you know, if you if Brian Armstrong were up here today, I think he would say as well, you know, may, does he wish he had gone public in a different jurisdiction in the United States? Mm. And the SEC approved his S1, but then sued him for doing things they knew he was doing. How does that make sense? Okay, so you just said you think there is still time for the U.S. to be a leader. How much time is still time? Like, yeah. Where in the hourglass are we? Well, I, I mean, look, I want to be realistic about this. The United States is what, 23% of global GDP. Mm. If, the, if the U.S. gets its act together years from now, it probably it's such an important economic actor that it, it feels like that option always exists because the, where, of where the U.S. stands in a global GDP per point of view. And it is really the, the finance capital of the world. But there are other finance capitals of the world. And certainly Dubai is, you know, trying to emerge even more so. Singapore, for sure. London, for sure. And not surprising me, you know, I've said publicly, 80% of Ripple's hiring this year will be outside the United States. And it's partly, why would I want to hire more and more people in the United States when the U.S. is making it hostile for me to operate here? And even with the SEC case, I mean, we have U.S. banks as customers. And, you know, I've talked to them post the SEC case and I'd say, you know, okay, so great. Now we can, we have a product called on-demand liquidity, which uses XRP. And so I'll go to those banks and say, hey, can, you know, should we engage on that topic? And they're like, look, even though you won the case, the United States government is still hostile towards crypto. The OCC is hostile towards crypto. And until that changes, the banks in the United States are not going to engage meaningfully. So I don't think the window has passed for the U.S. to be a leader but I think uh, every day that goes by, these other markets, that they want the entrepreneurs there. They want growth. Uh, and, you know, again, I'm mentioning Singapore, London, and Dubai as three key examples. But, I mean, the Ripple's London office is our second largest office. Well, that's a really good point. And to your point of you're hiring a lot internationally, these are long-term decisions you're making. These are long-term investments. So even if things were to get friendlier in the U.S., would you all of a sudden shift shift back here? How are you thinking about the long term for Ripple? Well, look, I mean, a majority of our employees are still US based. I, I think eventually, if, if you zoom out far enough, you know, none of this stuff barely existed 10 or 12 years ago. Fair. So if you zoom out far enough, do I think 10 years from now, the US is gonna figure this out and have a constructive regulatory framework for crypto? A thousand percent. Yeah, so that's 10 years. Okay, what about five? I, you know, I, I don't know where I would go as we rewind, but I remain a long-term optimist. Uh, in I, I was in Silicon Valley for about 25 years. I moved last or a couple of years ago. But better technologies almost always win in the end. And I truly believe blockchain technologies are a path to reducing friction for financial transactions to the benefit of many industries. And the irony, and you and I were talking about this backstage a little bit, 
for some reason, crypto has become a little bit of a partisan issue. I, when I first came to Washington, and as Chris said, I've been coming here four or five years, uh, it was a totally bipartisan issue. And for some reason recently, it's come a little bit partisan towards Republicans being more open and constructive, saying, okay, let's pass this legislation. I thought the irony to me around that is one of the core benefits around crypto, particularly around payments, are customers who are, can least afford the cost of remittances are actually burdened the most. So I'm, I'm talking about uh, immigrant populations sending you know, millions, billions of dollars into uh, other countries, and they're paying, you know, the World Bank would say 600 to 700 basis points. That's outrageous. You know, it, uh, again, so for, for me, it's surprising that it is not uh, more bipartisan and that we would have seen kind of something pass already. Uh, but again, I, I think there's still hope. And I think now that we have a Speaker of the House, maybe uh, we'll make progress. Maybe. They have to figure out, you know, how to fund the government in the next nine days uh, as well. So they have quite a lot that they're dealing with. But to your point, if it doesn't happen, this Congress with this lead of the House Financial Services Committee. Obviously, they passed a few bills uh, out of committee, stablecoin legislation, a market structure bill as well. If they can't get it done before the next election, what does that mean? I, 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 I don't really know. What I mean by that is I don't know that the, uh, the presidential politics, I haven't heard either of you know, Biden or Trump really speak about this I mean, I think Trump once tweeted about Bitcoin or something years ago. Uh, he would true social it now. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Sorry. Yes. Uh, <laughs> but so I, I don't I don't really have an opinion on that. I, I view this as a bipartisan issue. It's good for the United States to have constructive engagement with next generational exponential technologies that truly can have dramatically positive impacts on our economy it, to the benefit of citizens. Mm. And, you know, the, the U.S., if you go back in the history books, you know, the, the fact that the U.S. passed clear legislative, legislative solutions around the internet in the late 90s allowed massive amounts of capital and entrepreneurs, I mean, think about that, like, I think we're hosted by AWS here. Mm -hmm. The largest, most important internet companies are based in the United States. The, the geopolitical benefit to the United States, not just economic, has been massive because we created the right environment for entrepreneurs and capital to flow into a next generational technology framework. Blockchain is a next generational technology framework. It is going to touch many, many industries. I would agree with people say, well, right now there's too much speculation. I agree. We need more clear, constructive uses of these technologies to solve industry problems. But you're seeing more and more companies doing that and you're seeing more and more traction. The United States should get behind that. We want these technologies to emanate here. We want to be to have that. And for whatever reasons, you know, I, I think the SEC is part of the problem there. You know, we have uh, been hostile. Mm. What you hear and you talk about how this is becoming somewhat of a partisan issue. I've spoken with a lot of Democratic lawmakers, crypto skeptics about this, and they cite fraud often, that a lot of people are defrauded through crypto scams. Also things, the questioning whether or not blockchain ultimately really does anything new that can't be done already, that it's just trying to recreate something for no good reason and potentially yeah. bad things come with it. How much more work needs to be done to push back against that kind of narrative? Well, I mean, the, the fraud point, you know, and again, you and I talked a little bit about this backstage, you know, uh, the FTX fraud mm -hmm. wasn't a crypto fraud. I mean, yes, it was, it was, a, it was a fraud. Uh, I, I don't know. like. It absolutely wasn't unique that this happened to crypto. Uh, there's other frauds that in some cases were even a bigger scale than uh, what happened there. So I, when I, I hear people say, well, we need legislative solutions around uh, to prevent FTX, it's like, well, maybe if Gary Gensler and the SEC weren't so focused on going after Ripple and meeting openly with Sam Bankman Freed, maybe we could have actually avoided some of that, right? Uh, I don't, I don't know. I mean, it, you know, Gensler won't comment on his meetings he had with SBF, so I don't really know what that's all about. But it, it strikes me those aren't the laws we need to clarify. Fraud laws are there, and there's many jurisdictions. You have uh, Chair Benham from the CFTC. There's fraud. I mean, there's lots of ways you can address that. And obviously, Sam Bankman Fried, I think, is probably going to go to jail. I know the sentencing hasn't happened. Yeah. Uh, but guilty on all seven counts.
Correct. So yeah. I, I don't think that's the core of the problem. I, I think, but to the other part of your problem, like the people who say there's not enough real utility, I, I mean, look, I kind of agree with that. There's a lot of excitement and there should be, but that also was true in the earliest days of the internet. There are a lot, there's a, a, a birth, just an explosion of entrepreneurial activity mm. that did result in the dot-com bust. But then you still have emerged from that Google and Amazon and fate meta, you know, like, yeah. uh, it, there's no doubt in my mind, these technologies, because they actually can be used to rewire how transactions happen. There's immense friction in how cross-border payments happen where ripples focused, but there's immense friction in real estate in bond settlement. There's a ways to use these, use these technologies. And by the way, I use those examples as aren't things Ripple's doing, but just mm. it's more advocating for the industry at large. Well, let's talk about Ripple, though, and the utility there. What's institutional adoption looking like? Outside the United States, it's been great. I mean, look, we- I'm we, sensing a theme here. <laughs> <laughs> I, mean, I was, it was a dark time. It, when Ripple got sued, December 22nd, 2020, Q1 of 2021, you know, we didn't know what was going to happen. Uh, outside of the United States, regulators are like, we don't understand what the SEC is doing. And we continued, I mean, 2021 and 2022 were some of our best years ever. Gro and we, the primary measure we use to measure growth, tens of millions to hundreds of millions to billions of dollars of transactions at a time when we're in the middle of this massive lawsuit with the SEC. So, uh, other countries, again, have engaged constructively. They see how these technologies can be used to improve payment flows. They see how cross-border settlement works today. It's slow. It's expensive. I mean, actually, the, the uh, head of the Italian Central Bank, I'm forgetting his name right now, he just wrote an opinion piece in the Financial Times about how broken cross-border payments are. Mm. It's 2023. And, you know, uh, these are technologies that actually the U.S. is, is trying to stymie it doesn't make sense. So I know you always would rather focus on XRP utility rather than speculation, but do you have a thought on, I believe it's been bid up 30% in the last month? Uh, crypto overall has been up. I mean, Bitcoin hit a low of, I think, 16 or 17,000. Now it's, I think, at 35,000. XRP definitely has been on a rally. I, you know, look, if, if I had a magical window into what drives crypto prices, I probably would quit this job and just go do that. <laughs> uh, so, you know, like I, I take a very long view, the big picture around these technologies and, and by, I'm very much a multi-chain viewpoint. Like, yes, XRP is extremely good at some use cases and payments is clearly one, but I think there are lots of other, uh, blockchains that can be used for other purposes that it's not going to be one, you know, kind of one winner to take it all. I'm already bracing myself for when I go check Twitter after this to see everything the XRP army had to say about this conversation. There is a passionate advocate group. And you could say that, yes. <laughs> <laughs> Look, I, I, I think that is a good thing. And there's obviously a very passionate advocate group around Bitcoin. Mm -hmm. I, I will say, and I, I say this to anyone who will listen, like the ideologues and the kind of uh, the maximalism that happens in crypto, I think is counterproductive to crypto. And when I pe see people advocating of like, it's all Bitcoin or it's all XRP or something, I'm just like, no, it's not. And I, I think we all have to come together. And frankly, one of the silver linings of the Ripple case with the SEC has been the industry realizing like, this was important for the industry. Yes, it was great for Ripple. And frankly, it was nice for Brad Garlinghouse to have the case dropped, but it's important for the industry and the grayscale decision. I think it's incredibly important for the whole industry to come together or, and agree on things here in Washington to, to catalyze that legislative solution that we haven't yet seen. All right, we're going to have to leave it on that note. Brad Garlinghouse, the CEO of Ripple, thank you thank so you. much. And with that, I have some words to say. We're going to turn to a, another regulatory conversation focused on a very different angle, and that would be from the CFTC. So for that, I'd like to welcome Chris back to the stage. He's going to be joined by the... All right, guys, you're hearing Brad Garlinghouse talking about the, 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 the lawsuit, how um, capricious, arbitrary it was. Um, they won three of them. Um, Ripple is tearing up the place. It's um, going places as a, a payment system. And Brad Garland is 100% correct. Um, there are going to be, there has to be interoperability, not just one crypto for them all. Um, so you have like the Bitcoin, the Ethereum, you have um, XRP, you have Stellar. You have XDC, you have Quant. All those tokens out there have utility. 
um, majority, and he did mention as well, there was um, innovation and then there was, um, it all went um, it went bust. You had the um, dot-com bubble and then you had the dot-com bust. We're going to see that here with um, digital assets. And the assets that are going to pull through are the ones with utility. Pay attention to that. If you don't pay attention to utility tokens, you're going to miss out on a massive um, opportunity of a lifetime. The greatest transfer of wealth is happening right now. Don't miss out. Digital Lifestyle out.